Hey everyone, welcome back to part three of this Bionicle retrospective. Uh, this will be the final episode of uh, my design overview from my time with the Bionicle team. So uh, the design process for the Fantoka uh, began in late 2006. Uh, again, we didn't really know what the names would be. We didn't know the Fantoka, the Makuta. Um, we just knew that this would be taking place um, in the swamp setting. We knew about um, the grand waterfall coming in from the ceiling and filling up the reservoir. Um, and we also knew that uh, the characters would be flying characters in this one. And so sometimes my manager, Christopher, would ask me to come up with a few paintings for environments just to help visualize and show to the team because no concept art had existed at that point. So the swamp or maybe an aerial battle such as this just to help set the tone. There was a long phase of just exploring themes um, and what we could be doing differently, taking Bionicle in a different direction. For example, we had um, we were exploring the idea of tabletop gaming. So th the figures and, and creating a game around them, um, the figures used to have, or at least in the prototype stage, they had a, like a hit damage, a dial on their back. And you know you could place figures X amount you know, a feet apart, fire, and if you hit another figure, then you have hit damage. We even went to a um, Pharaoh's Cigar in Aarhus, Denmark, I believe. And, you know, we looked at the elaborate tabletop gaming setup. We looked at all the super cool miniatures, the Warhammer figures. Um, so that was, you know, there was a lot of that inspiration up front. And I guess that just didn't manifest in any way. Um, but... I, I don't have any pictures of the prototypes, but there were back pieces, or it was on their weapon. I can't remember exactly, but I just remember there was a turn dial with hit damage. Um, so that was one potential route it was gonna go. Um, there was some additional concept work I did on just some, some new vehicles, uh, very small amount. Sometimes, you know, when you're on this team, you're not just handling a figure, but you're creating concept of what could be you're trying to make prototypes to sort of pitch to the team of like hey what if it's this but nothing too detailed it was just very very quick it was really silhouette and just real quick design exploration uh, my manager Christopher Roundall uh, I remember he was showing us a very early prototype I'm not sure if he had sort of pieced this thing together or not but it was introducing this he was introducing this to the team this was to kind of give us just you know a benchmark or a little bit of inspiration towards where we might be taking these flying creatures when i saw those prototypes instantly i just i knew exactly what i wanted for uh, the makuta and it was obviously a fleshy rotting zombie bat it was no secret i'm a huge horror fan uh, the team knew it. Uh, most everyone at LEGO knew it. That was my shtick. Uh, you'll see in this prototype, I'll, I'll be showing you guys here shortly, uh, that's, that's what I set out to create. I mean, that was, that was the design inspiration for this prototype. Um, I know I jumped on the chance to do one of the earliest prototypes for this because we were also discussing what the weapon might be for uh, this upcoming line. And uh, I know in the past lines, it seemed like the weapons were getting, you know, the Kordak blaster, it was getting more elaborate, but this idea of the zombie bat, uh, his stance, you know, the uh, seeing the way he moved and everything, uh, instantly I was like, it's gotta be something the weapon has to be absolutely fitting to these creatures. So I 100%, this was my push to create something completely different. 
And I remember pitching the idea of a napalm maggot bomb. And the team at the table, kind they just laughed because it sounded ridiculous. I get it. But I was being dead serious. But, you know, when you're just throwing words out and you don't really have a prototype or thing, anything there at the time, uh, it just sounded like, you know, a horror fan just throwing out disgusting ideas. But part of it, though, was I was really inspired to do something simple. You know, you can have these weapons and they can be elaborate all day and cost a ridiculous amount of money and eat up budget. But, you know, if, it, if a weapon fits the character, if it fits the story, it does not have to be elaborate. And so I was just like, hey, in my head, I'm like, let's just do a simple release mechanism just fed by gravity and use kinetic movement, action, energy. You know, if I was thinking of this as an animation, like you have this thing exploding out and hitting and these little maggot things flying out. And to get that kind of energy, you can't replicate that with just a push shooter, you know, just a poomp, poomp, poomp. So uh, I set out to make this maggot bomb prototype and I took, uh, I, I rummaged around, I found like two half spheres. I can't remember what they went to in the Lego. Um, and then I started uh, melting rotted sort of holes in them. And you can see in some of these close-ups of the prototype. I, all I did was I put the sphere together and stuck a, the tip of a hot glue gun in there and sort of melted holes around there. So it was this, you know, rotted egg carcass. And then I just grabbed a bunch of uh, squid from the Baraki line and just snipped all the tails off. So it was really just the heads, different colored heads. And I packed about five of those in there, sealed the maggot bomb up, painted it bright red. Um, and then in the body of the Makuta that I was building, um, I used kind of a, a girl's hair barrette on the back as the shoulder blades. And to the front of the barrette, I attached a couple clawed feet pieces to act as the opening rib cage. And that's, at the time, my maggot bomb was only gravity fed. So once you squeeze the shoulder blades together, the rib cage opened up and this maggot bomb shot out onto the table. So after I built this prototype, I did this. And, you know, whereas the team had laughed at me the week before, when I returned with this maggot bomb in the chest of the bat, and then I pulled the shoulder blades back and it shot out, the way it ping, bounced on the table and cracked open, you know, I didn't let them know it was coming. And then all these, you know, little maggot heads come bouncing out in different directions. And it was immediately, everyone was like, whoa. And you could just see gears turning. So it was... It's one of those things where, you know, a prototype like that absolutely can just change things. You know, talk is talk, and that's it. Until you physically make something, people will never fully understand what you have in your head. So I remember that moment, um, and I, was, I loved it because seeing the, that reaction, and it's like, hey, if you've got a group of dudes here, like really good designers, and all of a sudden they're going from laughing to like, whoa, that's pretty dang cool. You know, seeing these things. That was where I, I just knew, I was like, I think we got something special here. I think my manager, Christopher, I think the team saw it. And we just thought, if we're digging this, surely, I mean, surely kids are gonna dig the hell out of this, right? Um, so that was 100% where the maggot bomb came from. And, I, you know, I got renamed Tridax or whatever. I never knew what it was named till just like a week ago. It was always the Napalm Maggot Bomb to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's the inspiration behind it. And, you know, some of my favorite toys, my favorite toys growing up as a kid, um, old Ghostbusters toys, some of the figures had these like ribs that would open. And then there was, you know, the old movie Beastmaster which I think is phenomenal, but they have these creatures, these like tall, like 10 foot tall, sort of bat-like human creatures that come down. And then they wrap enemies inside their wings. And the wings were like lined 
with some sort of acid or digestive acid. So when the enemy would enter, it would burn them alive and then the, the wings would open and it would just be, you know, flesh and liquid and pile of bones come out. And then that sticking with me as a kid, 100%. Beastmaster, uh, Ribcage, uh, Ghostbusters, can't remember what figure it is. And just a love of horror. That's where this Makuta came from. That was 100% the inspiration behind this. Main reason it never was produced was because um, I was feeling a need to branch out and I was leaving the Bionicle team about midway through this design process. You know, after I left the team, um, I had nothing to do with taking the Maggot Bomb concept um, and turning it into an engineered piece or an engineered mechanism. I, I, I don't know who did that. Clearly it was one of my buddies or one of the engineers. And I've seen it since and I thought it was phenomenal. They did a phenomenal job because whereas mine just worked on gravity and simply squeezing something together and the maggot bomb falling out, theirs looks like it has a push button on the back and a spring loaded thing. So uh, I haven't tested, I've never got to test it because um, I've never owned any of the Makuta line, but I'm imagining this thing fired out. And that's, that's even cooler, because you know that's what I had in my head, was like this thing bursting out of a chest. But you, know, you put something together real quick, prototype, and gravity worked just as well. Um, but from what I saw, the mechanism looked phenomenal, and uh, just to have been a part of that, developing that weapon at the early stages, and to see that it actually did go through into the line, uh, very cool, very pleased that that actually made it in. You know, in the prototype, you can clearly see the figures, you know, his persona coming through and the way he's walking. So it is a, you know, a rotted, mutated bat, but, you know, if you're ever gonna have the movement of a villain, uh, I put him on all fours. Um, I can't recall if any Bionicle up to that point was walking on all fours. That's what I was doing. And you can see the back, the rear legs are spiny sharp points that's because i was in, like had in mind there he's not standing he is you know like an animal this beast walking around on all fours so it was a very deliberate um choice to make him stand on all fours and having a three jointed arm much like a bat so when this thing extended you had you know this awesome wingspan and these like this rotted flesh and these wings and making him look emaciated in the design of the head and um, in the prototype, it, he was just painted black and white so he looked very much like Pridak but I would not have wanted to take him that same color scheme because if, if I've already done Pridak, black, white, and red, I don't want to repeat myself as a designer so I probably would have taken him either some sort of rotted green or like, I think orange made a comeback. A color like that um, probably would have spoken to me. Something like, you know, green just allows itself to the sallow, rotted flesh uh, of these bio warriors. So something like that. That's what I think possibly the color scheme I might have gone for. I did start developing a more refined head design for the head element itself, which you'll see in uh, this concept art here. Um, the prototype head kind of nailed down what I was looking for, but you know, it's a quick down and dirty, like I've said in the past, and using a little bit of Sculpey, and he had this sort of extended double fang rat-like face, and I wanted to keep that element, but also mix it with a little bit of HR Giger. You know, there's definitely some kind of spiny alien look to him. And you can see also in the prototype, that was my main aim for that figure. That's exactly what I would have tried to keep in that set. Uh, trying to bring more silicone, trying to bring more spine into it to help accentuate this sort of fleshy rottedness of this character. The idea I had for the wing element, uh, what I was looking to do, always trying to push for something different. Uh, 
something he hadn't seen in Bionicle yet. Either the stance, the weapon, new pieces, or, you know, pushing the technology of like uh, co-molding or over-molding. The, the idea being taking, you know, fabric textile, and you could print detail onto it, but you have, you know, maybe some holes and rotted sort of things punched out of it. And then you have it co-molded with silicone over it to give it uh, the hallmarks of all the Bionicle pieces, the tech, the ridges, um, having this piece be flexible, but something new that you hadn't seen. So uh, in the prototype, that's kind of what those wings, that's what I would have been going for or pushing for between design and engineering. Who knows, uh, you know, what, if I had been around, what I could have gotten away with. Budget clearly was always an issue. Pushing the limits of the design, doing something new, you know, that introduces a whole new world of um, problem solving for the engineers and the mold making and everything. So the technology, we would have just had to see. But uh, I'm just giving you guys, if I had still been on the team, going into uh, that, that year, these are the things as a designer I would have been pushing towards. You know, I spoke to uh, one of my good buddies and uh, another designer on Bionicle, spoke to him years ago, and we sort of talked briefly about the prototype Makuda I had made. And uh, he was telling me that, you know, unfortunately after I left, uh, my figure just kind of fell by the wayside. Um, it's just that every designer is so focused on their figure um, that really no one sort of took on the figure that I had setting there. So they were now a man down. And it is hard when you're dealing with sometimes a few figures to, to then take on the workload of another designer that leaves. So he said, you know, it just kind of fell by the wayside, but it was sort of cannibalized and elements of it I think got regurgitated, which I've seen the Fantoka, the Makuta line. And there's parts of it where I'm like, hey, that kind of looks like, you know, what I had going on in that figure. Whether or not, um, you know, that was a big part of it or not. Like I said, the designers are all incredible uh, artists and super creative guys. So uh, they didn't have to honor any prototype or anything there. But hearing my buddy say it was sort of cannibalized, uh, that's actually pretty damn cool. I mean, it, coming from a horror standpoint, you have this, in my head, this like rotted beast that sort of just, it, for me, you know, I was picturing he just sort of manifested out of the fog. You know, he was uh, sort of the mis mysterious character. They didn't quite know where this Makuta came from. And almost like if he was the first one and he gave birth to, you know, this maggot bomb and then all the little maggots sort of turned back around and then devoured him. And then those maggots hatched and became the Makuta that you got. So for me, having that, like that image or that kind of lore, um, in my head, anyways, that's super super cool and i think the work they did the line i think it looked phenomenal so hats off to the the design team uh, they did a great job i think and uh hopefully you guys dug it i don't know let me know in the comments um but i thought they looked fantastic you know i was leaving uh i had not done any work or development on the packaging team so uh, for the fantoka line i had i had no input um, i didn't get to start doing any designs on packaging whatsoever. So so I only got to work on Baraki and Mari lines. It would have been a lot of fun to have been part of this, but it was just, you know, it was the right time for me to leave uh, Lego and the Bionicle team. Uh, so, you know, my, my decision to leave Lego, uh, it was of my own accord. Um, I had already been there for about four years. You know, I was hired in 2003, and for the first year and a half, I was on you know, construction sets. I was building stuff for the IP themes, Harry Potter and Star Wars and Batman. Um, 
And then, you know, I got to join uh, Bionicle late 2005. I think I said 2006 before, but it was late 2005 if you look at the concept art. And um, so I was already well into a couple years at LEGO when I joined Bionicle. And then after, you know, a year and a half or however long on Bionicle, um, just felt like the time was right to, you know, spread my wings, so to speak, and try something new. You know, when you're in a corporate environment, you can only go so far. You can only do certain things because of your workload or you have to stay in your lane. Um, I never felt restricted. Uh, Lego was always phenomenal, but I wanted to do a lot more. And I knew I was, you know, where I wanted to go in storytelling and direction. And I wanted to go on and become a creative consultant because then, you know, after I did leave, I got to work on a whole slew of things. You know, I got to work on story IP development for uh, Ninjago, uh, Legends of Chima. I've got to direct animated commercials for Lego. I've got to do pitch and spec spots. I've got to pitch stuff for television. It was just a gut feeling, and sometimes it just bottles up. And then, uh, look at this, metaphor is just coming out. It just bottles up like a maggot bomb, and it shoots out. And, you know, the maggots bouncing around. That's kind of what I wanted to do in my career. I didn't want to just sort of climb a corporate ladder. I, I wanted to embrace design, but also a bit of that rebellious fine, fine art designer in me and just see, you know, where this would take me as a creative consultant. So, you know, it was sad. You know, the team, great dudes, manager was phenomenal. Um, really appreciate them. Uh, for everything they did uh, in in honor of my love of horror films when when it came time to leave they all got together for a big photo which I'll show here and uh, I think my buddy Dave or one of the designers uh, turned everybody into rotting zombies for me as uh, my sort of goodbye photograph and uh, that means the world to me uh, clearly they they uh, they know who I am and they know what I love so um, but yeah, I, you know, it's, it was a phenomenal experience. And uh, even though this figure did not make it out, I feel like a lot of the elements uh, I put into the prototype and the thinking, I feel like in many ways it did transcend in some way, shape or form. It did make it into the, uh, the Makuta characters. So before I go, one last thing, people have also asked if I was gonna do more. Uh, the only other contributions I have to Bionicle was uh, in sort of concept development potentials for after Bionicle ended, what could Bionicle become, as well as the finale to the Mata Nui saga. I may do some videos, but that would probably be later in the year. So um, I really just wanted to take, you know, this time for my whiteboard series and just kind of do a fun, you know, nod back to my days of Bionicle and have some fun creating some really cool uh, Bionicle whiteboard art. You know, it, people have been asking outright about a lot of the art I've been doing during these videos. And um, yeah, I think I will plan to make these prints available at some point in the near future. And I'll be sure uh, to let you guys know if you're interested. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more. Send me comments. I do my best to try to answer as many questions as possible. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. So uh, thank you for your contribution and for keeping the Bionicle lore alive. Thanks again, and uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Cheers.